Hi, welcome to this webinar with Alex Tiemann, um, one of our senior vets at the Donkey Sanctuary. And she's going to be talking to you about common skin complaints in donkeys. And I'm just going to get straight over to Alex. Alex, it's been great to do webinars with you in the past. I'm looking forward to this one. Let's get started. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so we're going to um, just have a bit of an introduction today about skin disease in donkeys because when we thought about webinar topics, this is something we get a lot of phone calls about and a lot of emails about advice from skin disease. And I think people imagine there's a lot of differences there between horses and they get really worried about treating donks with skin disease. So I'm just going to take you through some of the sort of straightforward conditions and how you can have a really good approach to problems uh, in the donkey. Okay, so I think if you've listened to some of the other webinars that Ben's been putting up on our website, you'll be aware that donkeys come from different places from horses and they do very different jobs. And in many cases, the conditions that they get are really affected by how we interact and treat the donkey. So clearly, the donkey down here with Lisa at Packham Farms having a really great life and is going to be really well cared for and is unlikely to develop serious skin lesions without anybody noticing. Whereas the donkeys that are up here working in a brick kiln that have got full pack saddles on in 40 degree heat are much more likely to get skin disease. So when we think about the donkey, we think about what it does and how we treat it. And that has a large bearing on the type of problem that we're going to see. And I think this was really brought out to me by a fascinating study that the Donkey Sanctuary funded um, several, well, a few years ago now. And this was largely because we kept on telling people that donkeys had to have shelter. But anecdotally, we found that donkeys really wanted to come in when it was wet. And in court cases where there was issues about donkeys not having shelter, we would say that donkeys needed it. But there was actually very little evidence for this. And so we did a really nice study where we took donkeys, mules and horses, uh, spring, summer, autumn and winter, and the researchers clipped a section of the hair coat on the same area from each animal four times a year. They weighed the hair, they measured the thickness of it and the length of it. And rather surprisingly, donkey's hair coat didn't actually differ across the season. So what we found was they don't really grow a proper winter coat, which I think you'd, you, know, you, you might think they do, but actually they come from these very hot environments and they're, um, they're not adapted to grow the thick winter coat compared to something like a, a Dartmoor pony out on the moor there. And the hair is actually, if you measure it in detail, it was lighter and shorter and thinner. So this meant that donkeys really do have quite a difference in the actual skin and hair that they have compared to horses. So I think A.A. Milne got it just right here that, you know, Eeyore certainly needs his shelter in the wet weather and we must provide our donkeys with uh, protection from the elements, particularly when it's wet, cold and windy, or you will see common skin conditions coming up, such as rain scald, which is the dermatopolis infection, and the donkey is more likely to get hypothermic due to this prolonged cold weather than a pony in similar situation because their hair type is just not adapted to it. So we must remember to provide our donkeys with really good shelter, and that doesn't just mean a hedge or a tree, it means a proper shelter where they can get inside and get away from the elements. So, I think people are often quite worried about donkey skin conditions, but I think we start with the basic premise that it's quite similar to the horse, but the presentation is often a little bit different, and it's often because it's late um, in how people pick them up and they might not um, find the lesion very early. I mean, quite frankly, why they couldn't find this lesion early that I'm showing you here on the right, I'm not sure, and um, that's inexcusable, but quite often, um, you know, you've got donkeys that may not be very well handled. Um, they don't particularly get the same amount of ridden work that horses do. And so they're not used to having the girth area, perhaps the sheath area examined, and things might build up into more of a problem. As we've already mentioned, if they've got poor harness, we'd like to see work-related injuries. But having said that, what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation really is look at how we approach diagnosing a skin disease, so how vets and owners um, can think about getting the right samples and some of the common diseases that we see in the United Kingdom. And we're not going to look at too many exotic diseases here. Um, we can always come on to that if people are really interested another time. 
So the first of all is how do we approach a skin case? Because really commonly we get a phone call from a vet or an email from an owner just saying, you know, my donkey's itchy, what is it? And we can't really make enough information from that really bold statement to, to give you a diagnosis. So we have to look at lots of things. We have to look at the environment the donkey's kept in. Um, is it near uh, woods and flow lying water or we might expect you know, midges to be around? Is it bedded on straw? Uh, how do you look after the animal? What sort of friends has it got? So, for example, chickens can carry a little red mite and that can be really itchy if it affects the donkey. So what other animals are they kept around the place? Quite importantly, do other animals or humans have lesions on them as well? So some of the skin diseases we'll look at can affect humans and they can potentially affect um, you said chickens or dogs. So we need to make sure that we've considered the other animals on the premises. And there's also not much point leaping straight to the skin without doing a full examination of the whole animal. So I'm showing you this rather nasty picture here of this donkey that's covered in sort of pink irritated skin, some of which is weeping. The primary problem with this donkey is actually his liver's failing. And the, when his liver starts to fail, he then can't process um, the phyloerythrin, which is the chlorophyll product in the plant. And this is then excreted into the skin. When the sunlight activates it, it makes the donkey really, really sore. So we have to do a full clinical examination of the donkey before we go on to look at the skin disease. And in some cases, your vet might want to take blood samples so we can check out the liver and kidneys, whether the donkey has got low proteins, um, whether it's got high white cells. And you, know, you might be surprised, but even poo samples can be quite useful in diagnosing a skin disease. So we shouldn't just leap to the irritated area. We should look at the whole donkey first, its lifestyle and its companions before we even think about getting into the skin problem. I quite like dermatology. Uh, you don't need to have a huge amount of equipment. I also rather sorry for the equine dentist that have to carry vast amounts of heavy kit around. I can fit all the stuff I need for a really good dermatology diagnostic um, exam in a small box, really. So what are the things we need to have with us if we're looking at um, diagnosing a skin disease. Quite simply, forceps, so we can collect hair and scab from the edge of a lesion. So you can use your fingers, but I don't always want to um, be infected by the things I'm picking up. So I tend to use forceps and we'll put those samples we've collected into a paper envelope where we might necessarily get overgrowth of um, other bacteria. So if we want to go slightly further into the coat, we might want to pick up some superficial mites. There might be lice living on the coat, there might be lice eggs. So for these, we might use a little toothbrush, uh, preferably not the one you're gonna use afterwards for your teeth. Um, and we'll take little scrapings of the hair and collect those into a small pot um, or use a small scrubbing brush. So that's to get surface material off the coat. And I have to say, I should have put down here glasses, but I actually need the glasses to get a really good view of things like lice and eggs these days. If we want to see what bacteria are growing on the skin, which is really important these days, we shouldn't just be blanket treating with antibiotics. We should treat only with antibiotics when necessary and only really when we know which ones are going to work. So we should be swabbing the lesion with a bacteriology swab and sending that to the lab before we just blanket treat with antibiotics. Another really simple test that we often do is to take a piece of sellotape uh, and we just will press that on the hair, particularly, for example, around the pastern or around the perineum. And that could be very useful for collecting fast living mites that might run away if you've got a, a scrubbing brush. So if you actually just press it quickly onto the coat, you can pick up uh, mites, put it onto a slide and then examine that under a microscope. Some mites don't live on the surface, they live deeper into the dermis. And for those, we might need a scalpel blade and we'd actually scrape the donkey's skin just so we get to the capillary level. So a tiny bit of ooze there. And then that debris is put, a little drop of liquid paraffin, so it's um, less sticky, popped onto a slide with a cover. And that again, can be looked under the microscope. So really simple diagnostic equipment. If we have lumps and bumps, um, we have a variety of options. So one of the simplest is to take a fine needle aspirate. So we'll clean the sample, clean the surface of the, the lump, um, perhaps with some hippie scrub, 
and then put a fine needle through it and just aspirate the content and again put that on the slide so that can be really useful to differentiate for example a hard mass from an abscess by just aspirating the lesion when you've got things that are a little bit more fixed and you need a real definite diagnosis we might then move on to taking a biopsy of the lesion and for that we would need local anesthetic around the wound we would then use a biopsy punch or perhaps a scalpel blade on a handle remove the lesion and put that into some formalin and for those we would normally take perhaps three or four from different representative areas final couple of things that are really useful is your camera your smartphone because lots of times you want to get a second opinion on this lesion or to map its progress over time so we'll look at sarcoids later on and we certainly need to map their progress on how they're responding to treatment so we'll take our smartphone and take pictures of the lesion and finally it could be really useful to have a map uh, just a sort of printed outline of the body of the animal and you, you write down where the lesions are because there are certain lesions that will occur in places um, that are common and it can help again with diagnosis if you're speaking to your vet or if the vet is speaking to a specialist so hopefully you can just see from those couple of slides that when you start to take a dermatology history and diagnosis you do need to start looking at some of the details of the problem and you can't just look at the donkey and make a diagnosis based on the clinical picture because unfortunately the skin has only got a certain number of ways to react and you need to really dig down a little bit more to get to the bottom of the problem. So I thought really this morning we're just going to look at some common presentations that people phone up about. So one of those is the itchy donkey. So this is a really common problem that your donkey is losing hair, it's itching, you feel itchy just looking at the donkey, you start kind of scratching yourself. Um, and, and I think the donkey finds it really distressing as well. So one of the most common causes of pruritus is ectoparasites. So ectoparasites, anything that shouldn't be living on the skin that is. And one of our most common that we see at the donkey sanctuary is lice irritation. So if you've um, been lucky enough to have children and they've come back from school with head lice, you'll know exactly the joys of combing nits out um, on multiple occasions and how itchy and debilitating they are for disrupting, for example, sleep. And donkeys are no different. They'll be biting and chewing at their flanks, rubbing up against anything they can get to. Um, really nasty complaints. And in young debilitated foals, for example, lice can be quite a significant um, welfare issue. We have two types of lice. We have these chewing lice, the Damalina equi, and these live on the surface of the coat and chew the dander, move around, um, but don't bite the animal. And then you have hematopinus, so that's the blood sucking louse, which actually bites the louse, uh, bites the donkey. And the treatment for both is perhaps a little bit different because the biting lice can be treated by things given systemically because they can get them through the blood of the animal. But the chewing lice, the damalina, can only really be killed by topical preparation. And when you're looking at treating lice, you have to remember the life cycle that you have the adults, which are these fairly large, you can just see with the naked eye, two, three millimeter long sort of creamy gray um, insects, often living quite deep into the coat. And they'll be laying these little eggs, which stick uh, 45 degrees to the coat, um, often down at the very base of the hair shaft. And the life cycle is completed in about two to four weeks. But it means that even if you kill the adults, you have to remember there's lots of eggs that have to be retreated because they're resistant to most of the treatment. So you're going to need to repeat two to four weeks to actually break the life cycle with whatever product you're using until you've really got rid of them. Common sites for lice to be found. Um, in our donkeys, they often go for places that are quite warm. So we find them, for example, under the armpits. We find them in the little folds above the eye where it's a nice warm protected spot. We do find them across the flanks and particularly um, around the main area. So have a, a really good look around the sort of warmish areas of the coat, part the hair, look deep into there. When we come to treating lice, there's a number of options and this depends a little bit on your donkey. So 
for example, at the Donkey Sanctuary, we unfortunately have resistance to products for the Amelina louse. And this is partly due to overuse of some of the cypermethrin products. So we had to have um, a lot of research to find how we could get rid of the lice. And after um, a really interesting project was done, we found that tea tree and lavender oil had an 80% success at killing the adults. So we worked with this company AgriEnt, and we, they have now produced a 5% tea tree coat conditioner which if used fortnightly will help to reduce the numbers of lice and break the life cycle. And I have put up here a link that you can click on, uh, which is one of our fact sheets, which will tell you in a bit more detail about lice and the product that we use to remove them. If your donkey hasn't come to the donkey sanctuary, you may find that the lice it has are actually able to be killed off with permethrin based products. So those are some of the things like switch perhaps, um, or things you can buy um, from the pharmacy, veterinary pharmacy. But all those products, again, you will need to repeat at 14 day intervals because of the life cycle of the louse. And in many cases, you want to be trying to um, clip the donkey's hair coat before you apply the product. If you have a really long haired donkey, you do need to get the product right to where it's needed. So we might recommend um, clipping out the donkey, for example, in the autumn, before they grow a thick coat, treating with lice uh, treatment then, so hopefully they'll go into the winter without having lice because once you've got a thick hair coat, it's very difficult to get rid of lice. Okay, so moving on to things that potentially live a little bit deeper into the coat, you have a number of mites. So these are two small roots we've seen with the naked eye, um, and you have a variety of mites such as Coreopsis, which tends to live around the heel of the donkeys and makes them very itchy. Uh, Trombicula, the autumn harvest mite. So you might find if your straw, um, you bought in some new straw, the donkeys get particularly itchy. It could be related to Coreopsis mite, uh, Trombicula. And then you have Dermanissus, which is a chicken mite, which again can um, certainly bite humans as well as chickens and it can certainly bite a number of other animals and make them very itchy although it won't complete their life cycle. A few other mites here which you might have heard about in other species, Sarcoptes and Demodex, they're not common, um, they certainly are reported but to diagnose those you will have to take deep skin scrape and they occur more frequently in immunosuppressed animals. So if your donkey is suffering from Sarcoptes or Demodex it's more likely that perhaps it's a very old animal or it has some other immunosuppression. So for the mites, if you remember, to actually diagnose them, we'll need a sellotape strip or we'll need um, a scalpel blade to actually get a little bit of a scrape and get that material examined under the microscope. And they will make donkeys really itchy and can be quite difficult to treat. And part of this is that there's no real licensed product for use in the donkey. So you're having to use a number of products off label and keep repeating. So some of the things you might want to try doing is clipping and cleaning, particularly affected lower limbs as this little donkey here has got. Uh, some of the spray on products are quite good. So Frontline, which is Fipronil, uh, licensed for dogs, is a good product to use to get rid of mites. As you can see, our staff here, when they have to treat a number of animals, do have to be quite careful because um, breathing in too much to these type of products is not particularly good for you either. So in this case, we had a barn full of donkeys that was itching and so they're actually wearing full PPE to spray the donkeys down with a, um, a topical treatment to remove the mites. In some cases, you might actually need to change the bedding um, if you've actually got a, a really bad load of straw that's very infected with mites. So not particularly easy to necessarily get rid of these, pro these, these mites and you'll need to work with your vet um, over a period of weeks to find what works for you. Um, I'm putting fly worry down. as I think this is a really significant problem in the UK and also around the world. We have donkeys that live quite long lives um, in the UK and particularly on our donkey sanctuary farms. And as they become old and um, less able to perhaps move away from the flies, they will certainly get really bothered by these biting muskids and we often see these really nasty lesions down the lower limbs um, exudating uh, with serum and oozing and causing the donkey a lot of distress and if you travel to foreign countries you'll see this can be particularly bad. So these 
flies life cycles again they tend to be laying their eggs in piles of manure and dirt and you get multiple generations of flies as the summer progresses so the numbers start quite low in the spring and then we find they're building up to real peak about august time and then generally waning off again throughout the winter so we really need to worry about the summertime when these biting flies are causing a massive loss of damage and they don't just irritate they can spread disease to um, the donkey and between donkeys they'll cause hair loss they'll cause itching and if the donkey is fidgeting a lot to get away from the fly worry you will see animals starting to lose weight um, as the the hot summer goes on there is a lot of different types of flies that can cause um, problems. And I've just highlighted the fact that most of these flies like things like manure, decaying bedding, vegetation, running or standing water. So it may be that actually you have to think about moving your donkey to fields where there's, uh, for example, a really good flow of wind and they're away from low lying rivers they're away from the edges of um, woodland where these horse flies will be living in, in quantity. So we have certain pastures which are quite difficult for donkeys to live with because they're next to these kind of standing piles of water and lots and lots of fly numbers build up. And we have other pastures where donkeys, which are particularly prone to fly allergy, are much happier with because there's a really good current of air off of the hillside and they don't get bothered at all. So lots of different types of flies and it may be that all we can really do is, is um, change where we put the donkeys. There are lots of different prevention strategies we can use. So we have these fly masks that go across the eyes, around the muzzle and over the ears. So these are commercially available and they will really help donkeys where flies are bothering around the eye. Then we have this rather smart donkey down one of our farms that has these sort of zebra striped uh, fly protectors. Um, and there is some, some evidence that these zebra stripings produce a uh, little current of air between the black and the white markings. And this just helps to keep the flies away. So they also look really smart. So there are different ways you can keep flies away from your donkeys. Clearly in some countries where flies carry quite serious disease, uh, you might need to actually midproof the entire stable, but I think that's probably an overkill for most UK owners at the moment. What we should be trying to do is encouraging our natural predators. So if you can encourage uh, birds and wildlife to your stable area, they will obviously be eating lots of flies. So always think about how you can try and approach the problem sort of biologically. Put your manure pile further away, encourage birds to come. But in the last instance, you might need to be spraying things like the citronella based sprays um, onto the donkey on a regular basis. There are some feed supplements that claim to help um, improve the, the condition of the skin. So Cavaless has a, a nicotinamide in the supplement, and that is supposed to help stabilize the skin and the fatty acid layer that makes them less prone to inflammation. And in the very severe cases, we might need to rely upon steroids. But that is a difficult judgment to make because steroids and donkeys are not a good combination because the risk of precipitating hyperlipemia or laminitis. So you might, for example, topical steroids for a short while to settle inflammation down or a short course of oral, um, again, just to settle a specific period of inflammation down. Antihistamines in equines do work. They're very expensive and you have to use quite high doses and they can make animals quite drowsy. None of them will be licensed for the species. Um, I've used them on one or two cases where it's been sort of that or nothing. For example, in the Shetland pony that was very fat, we couldn't use steroids. So that discussion can be had with your vet, but we, we should be aiming to prevent flies biting our donkeys in the first place rather than putting too many chemicals into them. Sweet itch, yes, donkeys and mules do suffer from sweet itch. Um, I don't think they suffer as much as ponies do, so I had to actually search quite hard in my image archive to found a mule that did have sweet itch. But a similar thing, this, uh, this fly that has this sort of water part of its life cycle, so this lovely sort of stagnant water they like, and biting dawn and dusk, causing irritation preferentially, um, well, they often bite under the midline of the animal, but the irritation is often manifest along the mane and tail. 
So we have, uh, for example, rugs that will cover the entire animal, uh, which are quite expensive, but you can get them in donkey size. And as I said before, a number of topical treatments have to be applied really frequently. Uh, drugs that are not ideal, or actually think about rehoming this donkey to a different site where the risk of flea fitch is much lower. Sorry about the gruesome pictures here. I hope you're not having a cup of coffee and a biscuit at the moment. But another thing that causes donkeys to itch significantly is actually an endoparasite. So this is why I know at the beginning I said we might think about taking a dung sample, but here's a pile of poo and on it it's got these female Octopurus equi worms. So these parasites live in the um, distal part of the colon and the females use this pointy part of the, their tail, put it through the anus in the evening and they lay their eggs all around the perineum of the donkey. And again, for those of you who've had the joys of young children coming back from school with itchy heads and itchy bottoms, same sort of thing. These are um, threadworms or whipworms in the donkey and they cause intense pruritus. So donkeys will itch their bottom against anything they can. They'll break fences. Um, you'll see hair rub on the top of their tail. And the way we can diagnose this, if we don't see the um, adult females on the feces, is by taking that strip of sellotape and raising the tail head and putting it just below the anus around the perineum and then putting that on a microscope slide. And you will sometimes see these rather oval shaped eggs with the larvae coiled up inside waiting to break through um, and repeat the life cycle. So they'll be seen on a microscope slide. And they're tricky things to treat because a lot of the wormers um, are sort of used, if you like, further up in the colon. And there's not much of it left by the time it gets to the distal colon. So the resistance to um, the worms is quite a problem. Um, we have our own protocol of how we treat them with uh, a certain, with the, we do use a, a product that's available at double the normal dose, but it doesn't always work. And you may need to clean the perineum, clean the areas around the stables on a regular basis to break the life cycle. So it is a tricky parasite to get rid of, and we will always test our donkeys before we rehome them to make sure we're not passing this problem on to new owners. One other thing that flies do, apart from just irritate, by the way, is spread disease, as I mentioned. And in this country, the most likely disease they will be spreading is habronema. And this is uncommon in the southwest of England, and it's even more uncommon going up to the north because it's too cold for the fly to be spreading this. You'll see it further down into Mediterranean countries, so in southern Europe you'll see this, and certainly when you get down to Africa you'll see it a lot. Um, so basically the fly is spreading a small parasite that creates these granulating wounds. So if you do see this kind of granulating wound, particularly around the eye in high summer, and it doesn't want to heal, um, I would be quite suspicious of habronema, and it can be diagnosed by scraping the lesion to look at the characteristic sort of yellow nodules within, within the lesion. And it is actually relatively easy to treat with an ivermectin-based product. But just a bit of a, a weird one there because not everyone is used to seeing that. Final one of an itchy donkey, I suppose, is something that's quite uncommon, but you'll see it um, on a regular enough basis to recognise, is the donkey that has an allergy or an urticarial reaction to something and you don't always know what. So this was a donkey that I presume might have walked into some nettles. Um, it just came up in this massive hive. You can see these raised um, irregular 50 pence piece size lesions of edema that started spreading all the way over its shoulder, right the way over its back and all around the poor animal's rear end as well. Really quickly, that one was treated um, immediately with anti-inflammatories and they subsided within about four hours. Sometimes you're not so lucky and some of these animals that have got allergies can be quite difficult to manage and you will have to potentially go through um, allergen identification and desensitization which is a really specialist field which I won't go into um, but they're very difficult to manage in equines because there's a limited range of beddings and feed that we can actually feed them with so um, this is not an easy condition um, and you may need to require lifelong treatment just to reduce the amount of itchiness they're, um, they're seeing. Okay, 
I said we'd move on to uh, another straightforward condition that people see a lot of. So we talked about itchy donkeys. Um, donkey is losing hair. This is a really common phone call as well. My donkey is losing hair. So lots of things to think about. And going back to our diagnostic toolkit, you might want to think about what samples to take. Obviously, there's normal molting, so animals will lose hair in the spring and they'll often shed in fairly patchy fashions, especially if they're itching because there's some residual lice there. So patchy molting can be normal throughout the spring. We've talked about some of the parasites that will make them rub and lose hair. Some animals that have got allergic things, perhaps you'll get raising of the hair shaft and then they'll lose the hair later. And certainly animals that have an infectious dermatitis, such as a rain scald um, with a dermatophilus type lesion, the hair will peel away in kind of crust. But I'm just going to focus briefly on one condition where hair loss is important for the donkey and also important for you. So this is a little donkey that's come out in some circular lesions all over its face and they actually started to spread over its body as well. And this condition is ringworm, and it's a condition that's not a worm at all. It's actually a fungal condition, and the fungus starts to eat the surface of the skin and spreads outwards as it's finished what there, there was in the middle. So it spreads outwards and creates kind of circular lesion. And I just mentioned this one because it is one of the skin lesions, probably the only one really to be too concerned about that is zoonotic. So that means that you can catch it and other animals can catch it. And clearly if your donkey is, for example, doing some therapy work, then we might be in a position of um, having to close a therapy centre because we can't allow donkeys um, which have got a zoonotic disease to interact with um, people. It's actually quite, actually quite easy to miss this lesion in donkeys because they do have, um, in many cases, quite an unkempt coat. And although the photo I showed you um, here is really characteristic these lovely circular lesions in many cases you just get a kind of diffuse crusting of the skin so it can be easy to miss and typically um, people get lesions themselves because they'll be touching their mobile phone and putting it to their ear um, and then spreading the, um, the ringworm maybe up here so they'll start itching around the head or perhaps around the wrist where you might be treating the donkey or even where your belt goes. So if you start to develop lesions in those sort of places, um, then you should have a chat to your GP as well as your vet. And obviously vets always love you to, to talk to as well, but this is more appropriate to talk to your, your GP in this case. So if we've got ringworm, how are we going to treat it and how are we going to test for it? Um, we will take some hair samples from the edge of the lesion because the fungus, as I said, is growing outwards. And nowadays we have a really nice PCR test, so that's a rapid lab test. Um, we can send them to a couple of labs in the UK and they will normally do a 24 hour turnaround to see whether they've actually got ringworm present. Which is incredibly useful to know because it's a contagious disease and we need to be thinking of minimising the spread. If we know that we've got it, we need to be much more careful than if the animal, um, the lesion is due to something else. If we do have ringworm, the standard treatment is with um, enylconazole, which is marketed as imavirol, and you dilute it according to instructions. They have four treatments at three day intervals. They're normally not infectious after the 11 day period, so when they've had three treatments, uh, four treatments there, um, and then they can be considered not infectious, but the lesions will take a long time to disappear and for hair to regrow. You must remember that pretty much anything the donkey has touched has now potentially got ringworm lesions or, or ringworm fungus on it. So it's really important to also treat the grooming kit, your rugs, and um, potentially the environment. So you might have to sponge down um, saddles, bridles, um, the, the barriers, you know, the, the sort of surroundings, the environment, etc. It can be difficult to get rid of. Fortunately, in the summer, sunlight will help to get rid of it. But in the winter, it can be quite a difficult thing if you've got stables to actually remove ringworms satisfactorily. Um, so standard treatment with Imavirol, but quite an annoying and difficult thing to, to get rid of. Okay, so the donkey that's losing hair, a uh, common problem. 
and another one, the donkey that has too much hair. So this donkey is becoming really excessively shaggy and he looks like he's growing a really long coat here. Um, the hair is matted, um, half his belly is hidden by it and he looks like he's got little stumpy legs. So what's going on here? Is this a problem with the donkey, a problem with the hair? And I'm sure many of you will recognize that this donkey is probably suffering from disruption to his pituitary gland and how he recognizes day length. So he's keeping um, and not shedding his coat and he's developing this really long hairy coat that's characteristic of an animal that's got Cushing's disease or PPID. So in this case, the skin problem is actually a systemic problem related to a neoplasia right in the pituitary gland. And we can test for that with an ACTH test and we can treat with Prosend, which is a pergolide drug. Some donkeys find it difficult to cope taking this drug because it can cause a reduction in appetite. And you may have to acknowledge this and just manage these types of donkeys by clipping them out more to keep them cool in the summer and keeping a really scrupulous eye that they're not developing infections underneath the coat um, and they're not developing lice, et cetera. So that's, um, I put that in there because it's an interesting one that we, we do certainly see in animals. We should be thinking over 15 is a, a risk factor. By the time you get to 20 or 25, many animals are likely to have PPID. Obese donkeys can suffer from um, different skin diseases and a couple of things here that spring to mind. Certainly the obese donkey gets these really large fat deposits. Um, which I'm, yeah, we are. So I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but this, this donkey here on the right has got this really a huge amount of fat in its nuchal ligament, so just below its mane and big fat deposits over its flanks and blue peels. And the intern and myself saw one last week where these fat deposits are just starting to calcify. So we've got an area of hair loss and irritation here as the blood supply is getting a little bit less and this fat is becoming um, calcified. So if I tap my finger on the desk, that's pretty much what it sounds like if you tap these areas of dried fat. And they have quite a poor healing capacity. So what we've seen in a number of these animals is really unpleasant things where for example crows will land on the donkey's back and peck and then they'll peck through to these um, calcified fat lesions and they're very very hard to subsequently treat so this donkey that had an infected fat pad um, due to crow pecking was actually managed with intralesional sterile maggots which cleaned away the debris um, which the antibiotics and the surgical treatment couldn't manage. So very difficult conditions to treat. Obviously prevention, trying to keep your donkey in a good body condition score from a young age is best, but if you do end up with a donkey that's really fat and it's got these calcified areas, it's probably worth putting a summer sheet on them in the uh, summer month. And if you see birds landing on their back to peck them, really good attention to cleaning those wounds before they go deeper into the areas where treatment is very hard. Okay, so just briefly mentioning wounds, but we're not going to go into detail because I think that's a, a really big topic that people want a lot of information about. But just really wanted to sort of highlight the fact that Donkey Sanctuary does work with a lot of partners um, to try and reduce the amount of wounds in donkeys because it's one of the really big issues that we see that animals that are worked in harness that can't stop working because the owners depend upon it for livelihood, that we see these wounds typically along the back there and also um, sometimes around the mouth area if they're bitted animals. So we do have a lot of resources. And if you're interested in this, I'd just really like to direct you to our good harness guide um, and our pack saddle resources. So Chris here, who looks like he's sort of waving and gesticulating, is, is the loveliest man ever. And he um, is really passionate about reducing wounds on donkeys' back in particular. So he travels around the world to different communities helping to create really good sustainable pack saddles that won't cause lesions to donkey's backs because by the time you've got the wound it's too late what we need to do is think about prevention so so if you're interested i'd really highlight going on those resources um, but i'm not going to cover wounds in this shortish webinar um, so i think that's a, quite a big topic really for for people to consider so one thing that's quite unpleasant and we see a lot of the United Kingdom as these sarcoid tumours so I'm sure 
anyone who's owned a horse or a donkey will have heard the word sarcoid. And I think it's really important that you take them seriously. These are tumours. Um, they aren't necessarily tumours that spread internally to other organs. They can be locally extremely aggressive. And unfortunately, they will lead to a number of animals being put to sleep just because of the way they infiltrate locally, they keep growing. Treatment is quite unpleasant for the animal and it certainly um, is not always possible to remove in every case. Donkey sarcoids are often detected late and I think this is again potentially due to the job they do. So if you're riding a horse you're always feeling around its girth area which is a common sight for sarcoids to occur and um, they're not so hairy some horses around their sort of ventral abdomen and sheath area and so those areas are often checked more often and sometimes in donkeys those areas are not checked as frequently and the sheath in particular for the gelding donkeys is a real site of sarcoid growth. We know there's a link to a bovine papillomavirus and we're pretty certain there's also a link to fly transmission so another really good reason why we should try and minimize fly worry amongst our donkeys is that there is certainly reasonably good evidence that the bovine papillomavirus that's linked to sarcoid can be spread by fly irritation. <clears throat> Some animals also seem unfortunately to have a susceptibility to sarcoid so you will see um, some donkey groups and family groups that tend to have really nasty sarcoids coming up on repeat occasions but other animals won't. So there is something also linked to the um, major histocompatibility complex where animals have um, a susceptibility to or not to sarcoid tumours. Particularly important to check thin skinned areas and where flies like to bite and where there's more sweating. So the periocular area is a common site for sarcoids to develop. So all around the eye, particularly sort of lateral and medial campus. Armpits, groin, sheath, as I've said before, are areas that are really common sites. And also where there's been uh, a wound. So if a wound isn't healing, for example, on the lower limb or somewhere else on the body, so we've got one at the moment I'm treating on the withers, um, started off as looking like a non-healing wound, but pretty quickly showed transformation to a sarcoid. So if something's not healing within a reasonable space of time, so two, three weeks, um, high suspicion there there's something else going on and a sarcoid would be quite a, a common differential. There is a complicated classification system which vets should be fairly familiar with um, and I think you just get the idea sort of starting on the left these occult, so hidden, warty and nodular sarcoids, moving on to these really quite severe and aggressive sarcoids which are these sort of fibroblastic ones where they're open and ulcerated and to these ones that are sort of completely taking over the animals. So, and the trouble is for the vet and the owner is that Although in classification systems they're broken down to look like quite neat packages, in the real biological live animal they sort of vary a little bit. So this one here on the bottom left of the screen looks a bit like ringworm and the one there on the top right just looks like a bit of a wound with the, the, you know, broken knees when the animal's fallen over. So it's sometimes quite difficult to classify them as neatly as you'd like and it's sometimes quite difficult to say exactly what they are without doing further investigations. And we do have to be quite careful with further investigations because a biopsy without a follow-up is quite likely to then exacerbate the sarcoid lesion. So if you do you know, end up deciding that this lesion is biopsying, you need to be in a position to go ahead and start treatment fairly quickly anyway, in case it flares up. There's a number of treatment options and any disease that has lots of treatment options is normally of course no one treatment option is very good. So we have surgery, probably shouldn't just remove them with a, a knife only because they will grow back. So we have laser surgery is better. So the laser is very finely um, causing heat necrosis of the tumor cells and we try and make a big margin around the wound. Cryosurgery is freezing. So again, trying to destroy the tumor cells in an area around the sarcoid. There's a number of chemotherapy options which are topically applied or injected into the lesion. So things such as mitomycin, such as 5-fluorouracil, such as BCG, um, such as a 4 lude So some of these are human uh, chemotherapy agents, some of which are specifically veterinary. All of them require really careful treatment, PPE, veterinary application only. 
Radiotherapy can be useful for some lesions, but it's clearly highly expensive and there's only a couple of sites in the country that can actually perform radiotherapy safely. And in many cases, we rely upon a combination of treatment. So we might remove the, the bulk of the tumour with a laser, and then we might treat the base of it with some chemotherapy. So prolonged, expensive and complicated disease. So if you do have sarcoid on your donkey, treatment early is much better, and really good treatment the first time is much better. So this is horse data, and I think you'll just see that ordinary surgery with a scalpel blade quite a low success rate, maybe even down as 18%, although perhaps at the higher end they're quite good. When we start using things like the surgical laser, we get better success rates. Chemotherapy, mitomycin up to 96%, A4 Ludes cream up to 80%, nothing's 100%. The radiation therapy, probably the best at, 100, at nearly 100% treatment um, success there, but it is a nasty disease don't mess about don't sort of use homemade recipes um, aloe vera etc sarcoids are tumors they are cancers of the skin i can't get across that significant fact um, too strongly these are skin cancers um, and i think you you really must get these treated successfully and strongly at the first attempt so, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. This little donkey, Basil, had this really horrible fibroblastic lesion at the lateral canthus of his left eye a couple of years ago with a number of subsidiary nodules all around it. And I think, you know, you could look at that and think that's not going to do. But it was treated um, with a course of chemotherapy, injectable, topical, and banding the root of it with lesion, uh, with chemotherapy. And two years later on, Basil's done fantastically, very small scar just behind his eye to show you where he once had a really horrible skin tumour. But he'll be monitored by the vets at the donkey sanctuary on a three monthly basis to make sure there's no regrowth. And we'll also check the rest of the body really carefully on a regular basis. So we know he's susceptible to sarcoids and we will manage him really carefully. So I'm really sorry to put this slide in, but we're just at the end really now. And I think I'd just like to make a little bit of a plug for some of the donkey sanctuary's other work that we're talking about donkey skin. Donkey skin should stay on donkeys. Um, obviously, you might be aware of the fact that donkey skin trade is something that we've been passionately campaigning to reduce, prevent, um, replace. Um, as an ingredient for traditional Chinese medicine, we are really passionate about trying to prevent poor welfare for donkeys in this industry. So again, I'd really encourage you if you're interested in skins and hopefully if you stayed with us for the half an hour or so of this talk you are, have a look at that report. It's absolutely brilliant. And finally, just to say that grooming your donkey is particularly good for you. It will lower your stress levels, make you feel a lot happier and grooming's really good for donkeys. They love grooming each other. So if you want to pick up skin lesions, spend plenty of time grooming your donkey, and I think you'll get a lot of pleasure out of it. Alex, what I really picked up on there is the importance of a hands-on approach. Um, yeah. And our training course is really noticeable because of that thicker coat. When you're grooming your donkey, using your other hand to feel for lumps, bumps, cuts, anything that might need further investigation, maybe more so than a horse where that thinner coat, you can see a lot of things. And I think so many things are missed in donkeys because people just don't get hands on enough. Would you, would you agree that's an important thing for owners to do? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it is something that's neglected, particularly over the winter months, because the donkeys typically aren't rugged. and so the coat, you know, becomes a bit unattractive for people to groom, if you like. It's sort of wet and, um, you know, maybe doesn't smell so nice. And so people tend to not put as much effort in. The daylight is short. You know, they go to work, they come home, it's dark. And people don't always look well. Um, and I think it, it is, as you say, something that's missed. And people, a lot of owners of donkeys, um, really lovely people but perhaps a little bit nervous about asking their donkey to stand well to have its belly brushed to stand well for the inside of its thighs to be checked and so the donkey can then develop well you know as a behavior specialist is quite sort of you know they'll move away the owner will get a little bit frightened so these areas don't get checked so if you start running into these kind of problems where you can't actually check your donkey 
then you need to come and talk to you benefits and behavior advice because if you don't check those areas then you can't find there's a problem so i think it's it is a bit of a team approach that um you know if you're a bit worried the donkey is really clever and picked up on your your nerve so yeah we should be checking really hands-on then yeah definitely i think making sure that we can check those vulnerable areas, the sheath, the other area are really crucial. A lot of people don't because they're not grooming. They don't actually just put their hands there, run their hands over. And, and if the donkey's not comfortable, that little training program to get them comfortable with it is crucially yeah. important for those. Yeah. And the other thing I, I pick, picked up on, Alex, here is that there's so many different skin uh, conditions. But as you said, the skin can only present in a certain number of ways. So this is really essential that people don't try and diagnose a skin condition themselves and treat it as you said with some cream or something lice powder for instance this is common you know mm. but actually this is a get your vet involved get a, a good diagnosis early on so that you can get the right treatment uh, for the animal that's such a good point ben because i think everybody feels like they're a skin expert because they can see it I mean, nobody feels very confident being a liver expert, so you kind of leave that to the specialist. But skin, that's like everyone can see it. They slap on a cream, they put something out the cupboard. Um, and equine skin is generally sort of thinner than ours because we don't have that hair to put, you know, so our skin is actually quite thick. Um, so you shouldn't really be putting things on unless you know what the problem is. And it's not that easy without taking those little bit of time to get the diagnosis. So I say it is one of my sort of pet hates, really, when people phone up and just say, you know, they send a picture of a donkey and they say, what is it? And it's like, I have no idea until you put a bit of work in. <laughs> yeah, good, really good point, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, the same with behaviour. My donkey kicks, why? You know, so it's really investigation. <laughs> <That's> my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, investigation, getting in deeper, getting yeah. a, a, a vet involved at an early stage so that the prognosis is, is much um, better rather than finding something really late and, and it's too late to do something or I think worst case applied the wrong cream or and actually made a condition worse mm -hmm. um, and delayed the proper treatment so really important that we always take that um, advice and get a vet involved properly right at the start thanks Ben Alex brilliant thank you so much and I will look forward to some more webinars with you in the future